Let's go to uh, Hebrews chapter 12. I want to be an encouragement to you this afternoon. Uh, I'm, I'm just basically going to look at a thought. I'm not going to break down the text or anything because I, we're going to be doing that in the morning time. We're just a couple chapters away from this in our study of Hebrews. <laughs> but um, I want it to be a blessing and an encouragement. I'm, I'm very tickled that for you folks that are online, we are so glad to have you. And we love you in the Lord. And uh, I wish, like anything, we could be together. Um, but if the whole world falls apart between now and that time, we'll be together then. Amen. Um, Anyway, Hebrews chapter 12, and I want to look at verse 2. He says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. <clears throat> before we get started, I, I want to show you all something that um, it's totally different than everything I'd always heard. I've always heard that the joy set before the Lord was all the souls that would be saved uh, because of His sacrifice. But after looking at the Bible a little more closely, I, I disagree with that statement. Um, for instance, if you'll keep your hand right there, go, flip over to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Oh, there's Brother Sam, always leading everything to Acts chapter 2. No, just kidding. Now, in Acts chapter 2, verses 25 through 28, Peter is quoting um, David from Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11. And look what he says. He says, For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Now we know that's a quote concerning Jesus Christ. Uh, Acts 13.35 tells us that. But look at the next phrase, verse 28. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Did you hear that? Now this is a prophecy of Jesus Christ. And he says to his father, Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. See, I believe the joy that was set before Christ was the look on the father's face when it was finished and he brought that blood to the mercy seat. I believe that's what he wanted. Amen. I would take the joy of the Father's face and His mercy shining upon me over a thousand souls being one an hour in my ministry just to see. Hey, I'm all for souls, but it's all about seeing Him, isn't it? Amen. That's what I believe that joy means. So anyway, but I want to look at the first three words, looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. That's the title of my message today. Um, you know, simple... Simple religion won't do. It, it just, religion won't save the soul. Religion won't help anybody. Uh, if, if you have a Sunday Christianity, it's not enough. You know why? Because it's not practical. It's not practical to go to church and, and whether you give testimony, sing, praise, participate, or whatever, and then you leave your religion there and you go out into the world. Amen? That's not practical. It, it doesn't, doesn't help the addict. It doesn't uh, console the the uh, disparate believer. Amen? Um, same way with an emotional, spasmodic Christianity. You know, you come in and, and it's all about hollering, screaming, excitement, and, and all this stuff. That won't help you either. Because when it's all over, you're still just as empty as when you walked in and started your screaming and your shouting. So what's, what's the answer for that? Well, we need biblical Christianity, not dry, dead Sunday Christianity, not spasmodic, charismatic Christianity. We need biblical Christianity, 
And biblical Christianity will flourish in the lives of believers. It'll flourish Sunday to Sunday. Not just Sunday and Sunday, but Sunday to Sunday. As a matter of fact, uh, true biblical Christianity is a wellspring in any kind of conditions. No matter what your situation is, no matter what you're going through, true biblical Christianity is a well of life, except in one condition, and that's sin. Biblical Christianity does not thrive in sin. The only help for mankind before salvation and after salvation is biblical Christianity. That's the only way. And you say, well, where in the world can I find this kind of religion? Where can I find this kind of Christianity? It's right here in our text. Looking unto Jesus. Did you hear it? I bet you thought I was going to say, come on down to Old Paths Baptist Church, didn't you? Looking unto Jesus. That was biblical Christianity. From the apostles who turned the world upside down to the martyrs that gladly bore his name when they went to the stake. So what's your religion? Looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. Philippians 1.21 states it another way. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. In Colossians 3.11, we hear where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. That's the religion we're talking about. Looking unto Jesus. Not the pastor, not the church. Amen, I'm thankful for our church. But if we're not looking unto Jesus, we will fail. Amen. We will fail. Uh, Ephesians 2.14 says, For He is our peace. Amen. Not, not the church. Amen. Not your wife. Not your husband. He is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Galatians 2.20, He says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Looking unto Jesus. I know for a fact that as a Christian we can take our eyes off Jesus. I know that. Amen. Peter did it when he walked on water. Peter did it when he denied Christ. Amen. Peter did it when he went a-fishing. But when he got looking unto Jesus, when he put his life back in the hands, the capable hands of Jesus Christ, he preached and 3,000 were saved at 9 o'clock and 5,000 were saved at 3 o'clock. Amen? That's the difference. I'm talking about Jesus, a living person. Not just an example as we spoke of this morning. Not, a, not just a religion. Not just some theological dogma. But I'm talking about looking unto the real Savior. And this is vital for our hope and it's vital for our growth. Looking unto Jesus. He said in uh, John 15, he said that if you'll abide in Him, you'll bear much fruit. He didn't say how well you do at church. He didn't say how nice you are to the public. He didn't say how many, quote, souls you've won. He said, if you abide in me. You want to find real religion on planet earth? You're only going to find it one place. Looking unto Jesus. And church, I believe every one of our church members is saved. I believe that. I believe you're people of God. I believe we are people of God together. Amen. But we will not grow. We will lose our hope. We will fall apart with our families, with our church, with our lives, our testimonies at work. We'll lose it all if we stop looking unto Jesus. Amen. So what in the world does this phrase mean? Looking unto Jesus. First of all, the word looking is a constant. It's a constant command. It means to look at Him daily. Look at Him constantly and to look at Him solely. 
only him. Amen. No one else. Um, and so I want to give you here is a multi-directional look at Jesus. And my scope, my, my bottom line in this message is to help each believer here today. No matter what you're going through, I can't look through your eyes. I don't know the things you're praying, the things that are hurting you, hurting your soul and your circumstances. I don't know. Some I do. Amen. But I'm trying to, I'm trying to encourage you to know how to deal with things like uh, why I'm in these circumstances or how did this sin enter my life again and I had to correct it and all those kind of things. They meant this practical stuff, right? So that's what we want. We want something real. We don't come to church just to hear a sermon. Amen. We come to get something real from God. So I want to give you a, a multi-directional look at Jesus. Amen. And this is very practical. How to look at him in your life. We're, we're already saved. If you're not saved, you need to look to him for salvation because he's the only one. But I'm here talking to the church of Jesus Christ today. And I know that we can take our eyes off him. And I want to show you how you can keep your eyes on him. Amen. And the victory that you'll have. So let's start. First of all, I want to say in this multi-directional look at Jesus, I want us to look backward. I would take a look backward, amen, just for a minute, look back. And we're looking backward and we're searching for peace. Now listen to this, I'm looking backwards and I'm searching for peace. When you look backwards, you see Jesus and his death. I believe we should see his death daily. I believe his death should be something that's ever on our minds, amen. Because when we look to his death, it is the Christian's only source for inward peace. Amen? We can become sleepy. We can become indulgent. We can become hardened. And Isaiah 48, 22 says, There's no peace, saith the Lord, unto the wicked. But when we get hardened, when we get into trouble with God, and then we'll start thinking things like, I'm not even saved. How could I say I'm even saved? And, and by the way, if you haven't gone through that yet, you will. Amen. No doubt you will. The, the life of the Christian is one of self-examination. Amen. We'll talk about that here in just a second. But, but when you're, when you're in, indulging or, or, or you, or you just grow cold on God and you take your eyes off of Him, when you look back to the cross, when you look back to the death of Christ, it will rattle your conscience again and give you peace with God. So in other words, what you have to do is sometimes we'll get into a place where we're tempted to do things we thought we had victory over. We're, we're, we're going down a road and we've made the mistake that we thought we'd never make again. Here's what I say to you, Christian. Don't, listen, go back to the cross. Go back to the transaction of when you were saved. Examine that. Examine how you handled Christ. Amen. Pilate said, what should I do with Jesus? Or what would I have me do with Jesus who is called Christ? Look back to what you did with Jesus. Amen. And that will give you a peace. Amen. See, I want you to know, the more we grow, listen to this, Christian. The more you grow, the more you're going to realize you're unclean. Like I said a couple of weeks ago, remember when you woke up, everything was bad? <laughs> Amen. You're going to realize that about yourself more and more. Amen. You know, some of the most humblest people I've ever met are martial artists at a very high level. People say when you meet someone like Chuck Norris, you never know he could just knock out 10 guys within like five seconds. You, you just wouldn't know that because of how humble he is. And you know what I found about these guys? The more they train and the more they fight, the more they realize how uh, weak their game is. Isn't that right? They become humbled by it. They become humbled. They don't go in their minds, I could, I could kick this or do that. And I, they become more humbled by it. It's the same way with Christian growth. We could say a lot of things. But as I go on in this this realm of Christianity, I remember some time back, I thought, man, if I went to Korea now, boy, I'd really be different. 
uh, I, I'm saved now, and boy, I would really be strong, and I would never fall for this, or never fall for that. And the next thing you know, something happens in my life, and I'm going, whoa, I'm in the wrong direction. <laughs> you know what I needed? I needed a little humility. And so you get in times like that, and you go, oh, how could I even say I'm saved? If I moved this direction away from God, I'm going to tell you something. I know I'm saved because of the cross. That's that's God wants you to daily take a look backward. Amen. Go to the cross and and see the more you you grow, the more you realize that you're unclean. But also the more you look to the cross, the more you will maintain daily peace and you'll stop trying to work things out for yourself. That's the biggest problem of the Christian. We gave it all to Jesus' as salvation, but then the rest of it we're trying to work out ourselves. That's where the struggle comes in. That's where the disappointment is, is we've taken our eyes off the one who died for us. This is what makes 1 John 1 9 so wonderful. Is here I am, I've taken my eyes off, I'm trying to figure things out, I don't know what to do. I may even be tempted to go the wrong way. I may even go the wrong way. What do I do? How do I get out of that? Well, you look unto Jesus. Doing more church ain't going to help that. You have to look unto Jesus. You got you to look back to his death. You need to get back to that. You died for me. <laughs> Amen. And that's why First John uh, 1 John 1.9 is so important. Because he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How does that take place? Why is it that God can forgive me like that? Because of Calvary. Because of his death. Look back to Jesus. A confession of sin, a confession of His atonement and His death will bring peace in your life because it was that death that pardoned you. Amen? Just go back to the basics. So take a look back. Amen? We're looking under Jesus. We're taking a multi-directional look. Next thing I want to say is look upward. Look upward. Now we're looking for our provision. Amen. We've got our peace back. <laughs> it's not disturbed anymore. Amen. We got peace now. But now we need provision. We need some things. And what I'm talking about now, when I say look upward, I'm talking about a daily look at his life. Not, not just his death, but his life and the fact that he is interceding for us and that he alone is our provision. You know what I have found is in this Christian life, we get into circumstances and our hearts will begin to despair. Am I right? We will. We'll wonder what God's doing. We wonder if God still loves us and all these things. It all goes through our minds. And the devil, of course, is a constant foe. And through this worldly system and trying to appeal to your flesh, will always try to drag you down. I want, I want to tell you, look up. Amen. There's a Savior who didn't only die for you, but He's alive for you. Amen. Uh, sometimes we'll want to go back to Egypt, but you got to look upward, away from your misery, away from your woe, and look to the only one who can really help you. Amen. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to this. We talked about how His death will help you. But listen to this from Romans 5.10. He says, For if when we were enemies... We were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. There's that peace. Amen. Now watch. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. It's His life. Romans 8.34 says, Who is He that condemneth? It's Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. What I'm trying to tell you is God knows the situation that you're in. And you have a living advocate with the Father, who is a man, by the way, and knows what you're going through. 
Amen. He know you're his child. We're we're assuming this in the message. You're his child, and now you're you're starting to despair. Maybe you're taking your eyes off of things. Maybe you're losing your joy. You have a living Savior who is there interceding for you, who never sleeps, who he said that he would never leave us nor forsake us. And I want you to know. Now listen to me, folks. I want you to understand this. While you're down here fighting with Amalek in the valley below. There's one greater than Moses up in heaven holding up his hands in intercession. If you remember that story, every time Moses dropped his hands, Joshua started losing the battle. And what the picture was is Joshua needed an intercessor. Well, we have one. Amen. His name is Jesus Christ. He's the Son of God. And he's pleading to God in our behalves. And I remember Moses' arms got tired and, and it started to drop so Aaron and her would have to come and hold them up. And they'd drop and Joshua would start to lose the battle. But then those arms would go back up, help him hold them, and he would start winning the battle. And it got so bad they had to put little stands under there because they got tired of holding them up. But we have a Savior whose arms will never go down. He is always in intercession for us. Listen, when it says looking unto Jesus, you look back at that cross. That'll bring you peace. But you look up to Him and He'll give you provision. He'll take care of everything you need in this life by going to Jesus Christ. I want that kind of religion, don't you? Amen. Amen. Well, let's look at this one. Now, I, I, you know me, once I get on alliteration and things like that, I kind of go to the extreme sometimes. But we have a look backward and we have a look upward. But we're talking about now a look inward. Okay? And what I mean by that, you say, how am I looking unto Jesus looking at myself? Well, I want to, I just wanted to use the word inward because it ends with (laughs) W-A-R-D. And sometimes you just got to make the Bible fit your sermon. That's a joke. I don't believe that. Anyway, somebody's going to quote me on that on Facebook, I'm sure. Anyway, what what I'm talking about here, look inward, is daily looking at his example and comparing ourselves to it. You see, when we look backward at his death, that's our source of peace. When we look upward at, at his life, that's our source of provision. But when we look uh, daily at his example, we see that he alone is our pattern. Think about this, okay? Romans 8.29 says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. Folks, that's a solid promise that you'll ever hear. God has promised for all of you that are born again believers, he already knew you before you were saved, amen? But he's already promised that you've been predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ, to be more like Christ. That's real religion. Amen. That's something that'll help you. Church can't do that for you. And and the only way that church can do that for you is by pointing you to Christ. Amen. Of course, I don't know of a better place to be pointed to Christ than right here. Romans 8.34 says, Who is he that condemneth? Uh, Wait a minute. I'm in the wrong place. John 13.15. He says, for I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Now, he was talking about washing the disciples' feet there. But still, the Lord gave us an example that we should follow. So when you want to look unto Jesus, you must look at his example and compare yourself to it. Amen. That'll help you a whole lot. That'll change the way you do things. Um, now... To, to look at his example and to get help, to change around, usually just a good relationship with the Word of God and prayer in the Spirit will accomplish this. Amen? You're in the Word of God. You're in prayer in the Spirit. I want you to know God will bless you. But let me tell you this. If you'll especially have a relationship with the four Gospels, looking unto Jesus, the four Gospels, Amen? Include them somehow in your reading. It doesn't have to be every day. But as much as you can, learn more about those four Gospels. Because if Jesus is our example, we got to see what Jesus did. 
I'm going to quote the words of J.C. Ryle here. He said, Let us Christians trace all the footsteps of our master's career from the carpenter's shop at Nazareth to the cross of Calvary. See how in every company and position by the Sea of Galilee and in the temple courts of Jerusalem, by the well of Samaria, in the house of Bethany, amidst the sneering Sadducees or the despised publicans, alone with his faithful disciples or surrounded by bitter enemies. He's always the same. <laughs> Think about that. Always holy, always harmless, undefiled, always perfect, in word and in deed. Now that's what God wants from us. He wants us, if we're going to be like Jesus, He wants us to be like Jesus. And that is to be consistent. Consistent. Amen? Sometimes, you know, we start getting inconsistent, don't we? I know I have in my life. and Man, as a fundamental preacher, that was that was a harangue. I mean, I could never be inconsistent. But I'm going to tell you, in my fight to never be inconsistent, a lot of times I became inconsistent. Um, you got to look at the example of Jesus. That's the only answer. Don't don't try to say, Pastor, do you have a rule book? You know, some people are like that in fundamentalist churches. Where's the pastor's rule book on what women should wear and, and how we should do this and how we should do that? And uh, that's not what he says to do. If we become inconsistent, we look unto Jesus. His example will straighten us out. You know, I'm talking to children of God here. And when we look unto Jesus and we see his consistency versus our inconsistency, what typically happens? We get right back in line, don't we? We can't help it. The Heavenly Father is our Father. We, we've got to, we love him. We want to do what he says. We want to be like Jesus. Am I right? Amen. You got to look at Christ's character. He was bold and outspoken when he confronted hypocrisy. But yet he was tender and compassionate when receiving sinners. I want to be like that. I need more boldness and I need more compassion. And when I just quoted what Jesus did, that makes me reflect, doesn't it? I want to be like him. That's the only way religion will help you is if it's the looking unto Jesus religion. Amen. He was profoundly wise in the spirit. But when he spoke to the spiritually poor, he was very simple in his approach. He was always about the Father's business and was concerned about the Father's glory. That's what he was concerned about. I don't know about you, but what I just read indicts me already. I believe we should be ashamed if we present some kind of a blurred copy of Christ's character to mankind. I hate to use this old rhetoric, but we are the only Jesus they'll ever see. If we have an inconsistent or blurred vision of his character, it's pathetic. In John 14, verses 30 and 31, Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. He says this world has nothing. The devil and his world has nothing in me. But that the world may know that I love the Father. And as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. That's what Christ said. That, that's the whole thing. I, I face the devil. I face the world. I'm facing the cross. I've got one thing I, I, I want to do is I want to represent the Father to the world. And I want my Father to be happy with me. Amen? Just that point alone is enough to cause us to go back to point one and two, isn't it? All right. So we've discussed a look backward. Look at the death. of This is so important, folks. Look back at his death. When you get to those points, you know, uh, I've struggled in my life. How could I say I was saved and I did this? Or how could I say I was saved and I did that? But you know what? You get them right with God, and, and but you go back. You go don't don't go back to where you sinned. Let that be a signpost that'll keep you off that road. 
That's what that's there for. Amen? When, when, you, when there's a sin in your path along the way that has caused you to get off the path, has caused you to do wrong before God, that, when you get that right, that is a signpost. It will never disappear out of your mind. You use that for fear of getting off the road again. Amen? You don't go back to the signpost. You don't go back to the sin. You go back to Calvary. And you look at what he did for you. Amen? And you get it right with him. The signpost and your sinful life and all that, it'll start taking care of itself. And you'll have peace with God because of Jesus' death. You need to, listen, look back, looking unto Jesus, look back, look up. He's alive for you. He's interceding on your behalf. He's given you everything to help you escape temptation. Amen. And when you fail, he becomes your advocate. God the Father could look on you when you fail, when you sin, and go, he needs to be thrown in hell. But he can't do it because of the blood on the mercy seat. And there's an advocate that goes, wait a second. He's mine. I died for him. And the Father says, you're right. Now, I just put that in man's terms. I don't believe it really looks like that. But I tried to break it down a little bit for you. But then we look inward. Am I walking like Jesus walked? Hmm. Finally, let me give you one more. And this ought to encourage you. Look forward. Look forward. We look forward for our preparation. We look backward for our peace. We look upward for our provision. We look inward for our pattern. But we look forward for our preparation. What I'm talking about is looking daily at His coming. He's coming back. And that is the hope and consolation of every born-again believer. Amen? He is coming back. I love this verse. And man, it just so tears up these rapture guys so badly. But Acts 1.11 says, you know, there's, an, there's angels standing there and Jesus goes up in the clouds. And the same, and you know, the men of Galilee, they're standing there watching him go up. The angel says, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, not a copy, <laughs> this same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have, as ye have seen him go into heaven. Doesn't sound like he's going to step out and be invisible to me. Sounds like he's going to come back the same way he went up. There's a physical, literal lifting, ascension, and then a physical, literal return. Amen? But what consolation is that? You know, he, he told us in Luke, he said, when you see all this going on, and we're talking about a lot of disturbances in the world today, amen, a lot of problems. He said, lift up your head. For your redemption draweth nigh. Now I want you to know something. We have an advocate up there that will take care of everything we need. He'll give us the grace we need to keep us from ourselves. He'll give us the grace we need to correct our indulgences. He'll give us the grace we need to walk by His pattern. And He'll even give us the grace we need to burn at a stake, get our head cut off, be drowned or whatever. He'll give it all to us. It's all because of who He is and His mercy and His grace. But the best of all of that is the fact that He's coming back again. And I really don't care if I'm on this side watching Him come or if I'm on that side coming with Him. It doesn't matter to me either way. He's coming back. That's my hope. You know, we all get all upset about this uh, elections and stuff like that. What if Hillary would have won? Everybody would have been moaning and crying and they're thanking God Trump won. I'm seeing Baptists go on Facebook and say things like, well, God really blessed and He saved us from this one because of prayer and all that kind of stuff. My friend, your hope is in the wrong place. 
Amen. My hope is nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Amen. I'm thinking about Jesus coming back. I'm thinking about He's going to straighten this thing out. If you think that Donald Trump is going to bring the church peace, you got another thing coming. As this world goes on, there won't be anybody that brings the church peace except for the Antichrist. When he first comes in, they're all going to fall in love with him. But I'm going to tell you what, the redeemed, the elect, will not be suckered by him. Amen. Why? We don't care about him. We care about Jesus coming back. My religion is not in the church. My religion is not in politics. My religion is not in the Congress. My religion is looking unto Jesus. He's coming back. Amen? Listen, we see distresses at every turn. We, Man, I'm telling you what, I can't believe how, how men are. Uh, I thought I was the worst sinner that ever lived. Uh, and, and by the way, I, I am boy, on many accounts. But you look at some of the things that are the creations of men's hearts today. It's just unbelievable. We'd have never thought of some of this stuff. It's crazy. It is so anti-God and so degrading to the human being of what's going on. And it can be involved with, I'm talking morality, I'm talking about politics, all of it, amen? I'm even talking about what people eat these days by choice. See, there's so many distresses, so many problems at every turn. But what does all this mean, ladies and gentlemen? Friends, brothers and Christ, brothers and sisters, what does this mean when we see all this out there? It's the birth pains of Christ returning to the world. And I'm going to tell you something. They won't know what hit them. I, I read something this week I want to share with you, okay? Um, you don't have to really keep your hand there, but if you'll go back with me to Isaiah 52, just for a second. I had prepared this message, and then as I was in my Bible reading, uh, I'm, I'm in Isaiah right now, I'm just about to finish it, and uh, I started reading Isaiah 52, and it fell right into this message, what, what we're looking for. See, we're looking forward for Jesus to come back. Amen. That is our hope. That is our consolation. And I'm trying to tell you that when he does, the world will not know what hit him. But we'll know. Amen. Look at Isaiah 52 verse 13. He says, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many uh, were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Do you see what's being said here? He is a servant that comes and he gets sacrificed. But look at verse 15. He says, So shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him. For that which had not been told them shall they see. And that which they had not heard shall they consider. Amen? Go back with me to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. In verse 10, it says, And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. Watch this in verse 11. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fall. I want you to know something. It, all of them, these men are so great in our minds, sometimes we are afraid of them. We don't need to fear any man. We don't need to fear the governor, the president. We don't need to fear the police. It is what it is. If we end up being persecuted, we end up being persecuted. And the whole time, I'm going to pray for Jesus to save them. And when I get a chance, I'm going to tell them that He's coming back. And you ain't going to know what's hit you. You better get right with God. Amen? But that's what we're here for is to be a message, a messenger. And we get so discouraged because we take our eyes off Christ sometimes. But I want you to know He's going to come back and straighten everything out. Now, let's just keep looking unto Him. See, here is wisdom. 
James 3.13 says, Who's a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. Amen? So what I want to tell you is, he that looks at the cross daily is wise. He that looks to the living Savior is wiser still. But he that looks to all four, the death, the priesthood, our pattern, and the second coming is wisest of all. That's our answer. That's how we look unto Jesus. We fix our eyes firmly on Christ. And we run the race that He has set before us. We love His will. Amen. We embrace His truth. We adore His church. Because you know what? We may know what we are. Think about this. We may know what we are, but we don't know what we will be. When we, when we get discouraged and start to fall down, we see things based on what we are and our level of what we think is devotion toward God or our level of ability to serve God. But I want you to know when you look unto Jesus, you don't know what you will be. You don't know where you're going to be. Amen? If Jesus doesn't come back for a hundred years, we should still be more like Him every day. We should be able next year on this day to look back and be able to say, you know, look what God's done in my life. Look at what things were picked out. Look what things were put in. Look what gifts He's bestowed upon me. Amen? That's wisdom. And the only way to get that kind of religion is to look unto Jesus. He's the only one. Amen? All right, let's stop right there.